Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Novel Pet Radiochemistry, Improving Understanding and Detection of Disease, presented by Timothy DeGrado, Ph.D., and Roger Shibley, Ph.D. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on improving the health and safety of people and the environment. The company provides scientists solutions to accelerate their research through its innovative detection, imaging, services, and informatics platforms. A leader in preclinical optical imaging, Perkin Elmer now offers the G platform of PET scanners, the G4 PET X-ray and G8 PET CT that will be discussed today to complement their IVIS optical and quantum micro CT systems. Perkin Elmer's preclinical imaging solutions support the discovery of critical insights in disease progression and therapeutic responses in oncology, cardiology, infectious disease, and other disease areas. To learn more about Perkin Elmer, please visit www.perkinelmer.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. And finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. DeGrado and Dr. Shibley. Dr. DeGrado is a professor of radiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and directs a molecular imaging laboratory. He has 30-plus years' experience in radiochemistry, radioisotope production, radiopharmacology, pet imaging, and radiopharmaceutical development. Dr. DeGrado has focused his career on developing metabolic pet radiopharmaceuticals and has brought several agents through preclinical, animal, and clinical translation, including 18S fluorocholine, which is now used routinely in many countries for imaging of prostate cancer. Dr. Shibley is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Applied Biosciences at ETH Zurich and head of the Center for Radiopharmaceutical Science, a joint endeavor between the ETH Zurich, the Paul Scherer Institute, and the University Hospital Zurich. Professor Shibley's research interests focus on targeted tumor diagnosis and therapy using radio-labeled compounds. Apart from the chemical modification and radioactive labeling of molecules, his group places emphasis on the biological and pharmacological characterization and optimization of the radioactive compounds, including non-invasive PET and SPECT imaging. The speaker's complete bios are found on the LabRoots website. Please join me in welcoming Dr. DeGrado. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone. I'm glad to uh, present our, um, our uh, research and some concepts on cell trafficking with um, positron emission tomography, or PET. I have, I'm sorry, my cursor is not, there it, there it goes. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with me. For disclosure, I'm a co-inventor uh, on a Mayo Clinic submitted patent on zirconium-89 labeling of cells. We'll be talking a little bit about that later. My outline is um, I'll talk a little bit on applications for cell tracking, some of the pros and cons of, of PET versus MRI for imaging of cell trafficking, and then look more closely at the PET approaches, both the direct cell labeling approach as well as the indirect cell labeling approach. So what, what are some of the applications? Well, first of all, um, regenerative medicine is now pretty much exploding um, with uh, the use of uh, cell therapies. Uh, that is cells that are engineered to uh, target a tissue that has uh, undergone some type of disease process, and we want to regenerate it and uh, get this tissue back to functional status. So first of all, we want to know, well, when we inject these cells or administer these cells, what are the kinetics of these cells in vivo after administration? So some of the questions we ask are, where are they going? 
that is, and can we uh, selectively target the tissues by engineering the cells or changing the way we uh, administer the cells to, to the body so that we can enhance the regenerative potential? We'll also want to know what fraction of the cells are hitting the target. Is it just 5% or, or are we getting a, a, a robust uh, uh, homing of the cells to the target? And then once they have hit the target tissue, are they retained there or do they simply clear very rapidly and therefore not have much of a chance to affect their, their, their target? And in this regard, we have to understand what are the body's clearance mechanisms that handle these cells and also not only the cells but the, the, uh, the label that we give them in order to image, image these cells in vivo. Also, we'll want to know uh, information on the status of these administered cells, the, the ones that we're tracking. We'll want to know, are these cells remaining viable once they're uh, administered to the tissue? Or are they dying quickly and therefore not having a chance to have much of an eff effect? Are they functional there? Are they, are they reproducing? Are they differentiating? Are they, or are they uh, simply exerting their effects indirect, such as expressing uh, cofactors or cytokines or whatnot that the, the rest of the body reacts to? Uh, we, we really are in the early stage to understand the effects of these cells, and imaging has the potential to start to answer these questions in a uh, non-invasive manner. Just quickly to, to look at the pros and cons of using MRI versus PET, starting with MRI. MRI, of course, gives us high spatial resolution for anatomic characterization. There's no uh, ionizing radiation involved. Um, mainly, we've seen in literature iron-labeled cells. So these are iron oxide particles that are uh, taken up by the cells before they're administered for imaging. We have to understand the res residualization of this label and the potential for toxicity of these cells. And this technique is only useful for direct labeling of the cells and injecting them into the body. For PET, uh, of course, one of the, the major uh, strengths of PET is its high imaging sensitivity. It allows quantitation at, um, for um, getting uh, parameters out that, that are quantitative and scale with the number of, for example, the number of cells or the enzymes that are expressing gene uh, reporter uh, uh, proteins. Uh, potential for low toxicity because of the low mass uh, associated with the PET labeling. Uh, there's functional characterization, especially for indirect labeling of the cells. So uh, we have two ways of go going about with PET, the so-called direct labeling with, with an isotope before injection and the indirect or in vivo cell labeling where you have uh, gene reporter systems. Let's start with the direct labeling and look at the PET isotopes that are available. And I just listed them here in order of half-life going from shorter to longer. Uh, cells have been labeled with, with FDG successfully and uh, used for tracking. Copper 64 with PTSM as the chelator uh, for labeling of the cells, and also zirconium 89, which has a, a longer three-day half-life, which, which allows longer uh, observation periods. Manganese 52 has hit the literature just very recently with a longer half-life of uh, nearly six days, although not much has uh, been done with manganese yet. Um, I think we'll see more activity there. Just starting with FDG, uh, FDG has been used to uh, look at the trafficking of endothelial progenitor cells here from Tamura et al. We see FDG labeled EPCs injected into uh, tumor bearing rats. And you can see in the, uh, I, I will try to give you a, a arrow here, you can see as a function of time, the, uh, the, the, the movement of, the, um, of these labeled cells, these are, these are F, F18 pet, uh, uh, micro PET studies here uh, going from zero out to 90 minutes. Remember, FDG has just a two hour half life. Um, so we're looking at the early distribution of these cells and you can see them uh, being taken up into this tumor here. You can see the, uh, the quantitation showing most of the cells homing to the tumor uh, quite ni nicely. This, uh, this was uh, 
uh, study looked at the effects of gamma radiation, which uh, stimulates uh, blood flow and angiogenesis and um, uh, neovascular formation in these tumor cells. And these uh, EPCs were able to track that. In another study by Kang et al., uh, FDG was labeling uh, hemo hemopoietic stem cells after administration to uh, patients with myocardial infarction. They looked at two different ways to administer these cells. One was through IV injection, shown here on the right, um, showing uh, um, uptake in the lungs, liver, and uh, spleen there as well as intracoronary injection where you actually do see specific uptake uh, in the myocardium. So uh, the, the uh, distribution of these stem cells look, of course relates very closely to uh, the administration uh, of, of these uh, cells and here they were able to see the uptake in the myocardium of these uh, stem cells that were injected through the, uh, through the coronary artery. Uh, of course, the half-life of FDG, two hours, is not going to give you much uh, signal at 20 hours after injection. You can see uh, very little signal, a little bit, but uh, in the heart, lingering in the heart um, after injection of these stem cells. It would be nice to have a longer-lived isotope for la labeling cells for PET. So zirconium-89 may fit the bill. At least uh, with a three-day half-life, you, uh, you, can, you can go out to at least a couple of weeks with uh, PET observations. And initially, uh, researchers at NIH, Sato et al., as well as uh, King's College in uh, London um, have uh, developed a zirconium-89 oxine cell labeling method shown here whereby the oxine, uh, zirconium-89 oxine is incubated with cells in PBS and they're getting 30 to 40 percent labeling efficiency of these cells. And uh, the folks at NIH did show that the, the label does not have a significant impact on the viability of these cells shown, shown here. With and without the zirconium-89, you get about the same amount of drop of viability in the cells over time and the labeling retention uh, pretty much parallels the number of cells over time. And the activity, functional activity of these dendritic cells in this case uh, uh, maintain fa fairly high, over 80% uh, functionality. And they injected these into uh, my, uh, mice and you can see the, uh, the uptake initially in the lungs and later on it goes into the liver. Um, whereas when they labeled cytotoxic T cells, uh, these T cells uh, again started at the lung but then migrated over to spleen and um, also that you could see some uh, sites in the uh, in lymph nodes uh, shown in the, the orange arrows. We've uh, developed a, a new labeling method which uh, uses a new precursor we call DBN. It is a uh, synthon that we uh, initially label with zirconium-89. You can see the synthon DBN here. Um, we have to label this with uh, biologically compatible zirconium-89, so we use a uh, zirconium-89 in a phosphate buffer for the incubation. Uh, we, in we incubate uh, 30 minutes at 37 degrees and um, we get the uh, DBN. Then we uh, label the cells with that also at 37 degrees. It's a direct labeling. We don't pre-isolate the DBN. We incubate the cells and then separate the uh, labeled cells from the, from the, uh, the DBN later and, and the, the, uh, the free zirconium later. <clears throat> with this technique, we uh, validated that it is uh, useful for labeling a, a variety of cells such as melanoma cells, stem cells, dendritic cells. Here we express the activity per million cells. We, uh, in our initial studies, was about 0.4 to 0.5 uh, megabecquerels per million cells. We did show that the, um, the labeling is actually uh, uh, labeling the, the cell membrane wall. And let me just go back to the last slide. Because this DBN has the NCS group here, it labels primary amines at the cell surface. So we're not, uh, we're not uh, incubating to get inside the cell, but actually having a reaction, a covalent reaction at, at the cell surface. And that really uh, retains the uh, activity on the cell wall. We showed no effect on cellular prol proliferation with the cyclone access, as well as no effect on apoptosis. 
apoptosis of, a, of these uh, cells that were labeled. And this just shows the, the long retention in, in the various cell lines of the radio label. It's not, it's not uh, leaching back out of the cell because it's actually covalently bonded to the cell. When we inject these IV into the mouse, you can see here that we have uh, uptake initially in the lung and some in the, in the bone. You can see the uh, quantitation shown here on this slide with most of the activity in the lung uh, as these uh, mesenchymal stem cells are trapped in the lung. If you give uh, phosphate, the free phosphate, it goes mainly to the bone. You can see uh, activities ma mainly in the bone and a little bit in liver and no activity in lung. So it's a, a good um, confirmation that we have good cell labeling and that the label is not coming off the DFO in vivo. We've uh, uh, collaborated with some uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, investigators, including Dr. Befar. And uh, he is looking at the stem cells for regenerative uh, treatment of the, the myocardium after myocardial infarction. And he's found that he could sort of re reprogram um, some uh, bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells with various growth factors. You can see them here, uh, uh, TGF, uh, IGF, IL, thrombin, retinoic acid. And when he gives the, all of these as a cocktail, um, he, he stimulates uh, a lot of the uh, transcription factors, you can see them here, that are indicative of uh, myocytes. And these, uh, these uh, uh, cells he's shown actually um, bring back um, the uh, functional status of the myocardium, at least in a, a mouse model. Uh, he's seeing uh, promotion of ejection fraction after uh, experimental infarction in these mouse hearts. And he's actually seeing regrowth of, uh, you see, mitochondria here in, in these uh, infarcted areas, as well as the uh, fibrillar um, regeneration in the, in the uh, myocytes. And if looking at the ejection fraction, so he took uh, uh, bone marrow samples from 12 different patients. Uh, that's across the, uh, the, the x-axis here. And he's looking at the improvement of ejection fraction in his mouse model after treatment with these reprogrammed stem cells. And you can see the improvement of ejection fraction is you know, anywhere from 10 to 40 percent in this model. And here, are, here is all the confirmation of the, uh, the cardio-specific uh, transcription factors that have been rebounded in these cells, or, or I should say differentiated into these cells. And uh, so we looked at where, you know, using the, the G4 uh, micro pet in our lab, we looked at trafficking of these cells in, the, in his mouse model, his in, the mouse infarction model. And we, uh, these, these uh, cells were uh, implanted into the myocardium, into the infarcted area of the mouse my myocardium. And you can see uh, these are the distributions at two days after uh, implantation of these cells. And uh, most of these cells stay in the heart, as you can see at the bottom here in the bottom graphs. But they do go elsewhere. And this is really uh, quite interesting. Um, they, they go lung, brain. That, that, was, that was quite surprising that many ended up in the brain. Uh, and, and it was uh, variable across, the, uh, across the, the, the mice where these cells ended up. So there's quite a, a lot of biological variation, in, in, uh, at least in this model of cell trafficking. And uh, we did show uh, that there was functional improvement whether or not we labeled these cells with zirconium-89. You can see uh, at 30, 30 days after the cell therapy, there was an improvement of ejection fraction in independent of the uh, labeling of these cells. So that was quite nice in confirming that we're, n we're not changing the functionality of these cells. The indirect method, I'll just speak uh, slowly about that or uh, briefly about that. So the indirect method of, of cell labeling can give us functional status of the cells after after implantation or, or administration of the cells. And, and the, the whole idea is uh, putting in a reporter genes into the cells that will express proteins that then can be read out by the PET uh, imaging method using a, a reporter probe. So there's a, there's a, a, a harvesting of the cells, and, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and then the uh, radionuclide injection 
after administration of the cells and you get the, the PET and then you interpret the PET um, as a function of the, uh, the, the stem cells reporting the, the gene. And there are many different uh, uh, reporters that are being looked at. Here, here are several. This is probably not ex uh, exhaustive. Uh, a lot of work has been done with the uh, thymidine kinase, uh, the herpes simplex virus, thymidine kinase, which is, uh, has many uh, reporter probes here. FHBG is one of the, the primary ones, but the others listed here. Um, we have to consider the, the normal physiology of the reporters and what tissue we're actually trying to look at and try to get a good uh, match of our uh, reporter system with the, uh, the tissue that we're, we're trying to interrogate. For example, if we're trying to look at uh, regenerative of, uh, re regeneration of the liver, the uh, TK system might not be the best one because this is the main route mainly for all of these uh, reporter genes. So we might want to look at another uh, system that is uh, uh, where the reporter has a very low uptake in liver in that case. Uh, we've worked a lot with the, the sodium iodide symporter here at Mayo Clinic, and uh, we use uh, F18 TFB or uh, tetrafluoroborate as a reporter for that system. Um, just pros and cons, the direct method, of course, it has an immediate imaging signal, very high sensitivity. Uh, for uh, tracking the cells in, in, in the early phase, but no information on cellular viability. Sig there's signal loss over time due to radionuclide decay. The signal may disassociate from the original cell, whereas indirect has the positive, uh, positive that you can measure cellular viability and function. The cells must be able to tolerate the transduction. There's high nonspecific signal from physiological distribution, such as the effects of perfusion, transport, metabolism on your reporter. So you really have to consider what is the kinetics and metabolism of your reporter. And the specific imaging signal is delayed because it takes some time for those cells to reproduce and to start expressing the, uh, the, the reporter protein. You have to factor that into your into your uh, technique as well. And the signal is dynamic and complex. And uh, it, there, there is limitations on the PET scanning sensitivity to be able to measure small numbers of cells that are injected. Um, and of course, you're depending on the, the expression of your reporter. If you're, if, if, uh, just as a, an example of being able to get a lot of signal out of re a reporter system, in this case, if you take uh, tumors or uh, cancer cells that are already uh, uh, infected with the HSV TK as the uh, gene reporter, and you grow a tumor in a mouse. Uh, here, you, here you can see the big tumor, and it, this is a PET scan of H FHBG lighting up the TK that's uh, being expressed very highly in this tumor. Whereas with stem cells, you're not you you have a, a limited number of cells in the body. In this case, uh, this. This study, uh, they in, uh, transfected into the stem cells the dopamine uh, transporter here, D2R80A, and they injected these into the hind limb of the, uh, in the muscle of the rat. Uh, excuse me, I think this is a mouse. And um, you can see a very small signal here. It's uni unilateral on the, on the side that, uh, that was injected. And uh, they followed this. Um, uh, notice that they implanted uh, two times ten to the seven cells into this muscle, so they were able to see the expression of the D2 uh, the, the D2 reporter using the reporter uh, uh, F18 labeled Fali Pride, which binds to the D2 system, which is not expressed in, in normal muscle. Uh, however, you look at all the, the normal distribution of F18 Fali pride, so this might not be a good reporter system in the gut. In another uh, uh, um, study, we, we look at FHBG with, again, the TK system. In this case, we can see here the, uh, the, the reporter signal is increasing in time. So here again, uh, you have 5 times 10 to the million cells injected, and it takes about four to seven days to start to see the signal to increase. This is indicative of the indirect method. You have to produce enough reporter that uh, the PET signal is going to start to pick it up. 
and in this case it was after about four, four to seven days. In this uh, study from Washington University, uh, labeled um, uh, uh, T cells were injected into mice as well as uh, patients. This study was to start to look at um, when you have chemotherapy or a bone disease that you eradicate the, uh, the, the normal uh, uh, hematopoietic system, you then get a bone marrow transplant. And then what can happen after bone marrow transplant is a so-called graft versus host disease where the, the uh, donor uh, immune cells will start to interact with the, the host and uh, give you this disease which, which can be deleterious uh, to the health of the patients. So in order to start to understand the mechanism of this, um, uh, this uh, graft versus host disease, these uh, studies were labeling, um, this is an indirect labeling with TK, T cells from donor, um, from, uh, donor mice into host mice and then tracking those with, with FHBG you could see uh, uptake in the thym thymus here, up here, and uh, later this is the normal biodistribution of FHBG. They did initial pilot study in humans, um, both in patients with the graft versus host disease and patients, uh, uh, excuse me, patients without and patients with. Unfortunately, they did not see specific signal for the FHBG in the study. Uh, they, they administered 10 to the seventh cells, and evidently this was not enough to give a specific signal on the PET to, to, to let them know if there, there is any uh, signal coming from these T cells. So again, this is a limitation of the indirect method, is the number of cells, and that these cells need to produce the reporter to give you a specific signal. So in conclusions, PET provides sensitive imaging platform for non-invasive tracking of cells in the body. Uh, the cellular toxicity effects are mitigated by the high specific activity of labeling with PET isotopes. The direct cell labeling methodologies have been established for these isotopes, F18, copper, and zirconium. I think we're going to see more from manganese uh, as well. And indirect cell labeling has the potential to provide readout on cell viability and function. But there are technical challenges to the indirect method, and um, we have to understand uh, our, 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 our limitations on sensitivity there. So I want to give acknowledgments to my group, Dr. Aditya Banzal, Dr. Mukesh Pandey, Dr. Ray Jang in my lab, as well as our uh, collaborators in regenerative medicine and the funding at NIH and Mayo Clinic Center for Regenerative Medicine. And I'll, I'm open for questions now. Thank you. Um, first, um, we'll hear our next presentation, so thank you again for your presentation. I will now turn it over to Dr. Shibley for his presentation. Hello from my side. Um, welcome, everybody, to my presentation. Um, hope everybody sees the first slide. Um, as I mentioned, um, we uh, are a collaborative effort between three institutions, the ETH in Zurich, the Paul Scherer Institute, and the University Hospital. And naturally, also, we have a, a different emphasis on our research at these three different sites. And uh, so I'm going to give you a brief flavor about uh, our activities uh, uh, in this respect. So looking at the current trends, I and mean, this is uh, the view of a radiopharmacist uh, in molecular imaging and uh, nuclear medicine, um, I would identify several trends um, at this time. Um, we have generally started off with very short-lived isotope like carbon-11 or fluor-18, and I see now, we have also seen and heard that from the previous uh, presentation, uh, the trend goes that uh, more and more longer-lived PET nuclides are, are used uh, for different purposes and also because of different reasons. Another trend is clearly that FDG, which is still the gold standard in nuclear medicine, uh, is uh, not going to be replaced, but uh, it's going to be um, supplemented by uh, different traces, new traces, which are more specific, maybe also addressing less uh, patient, uh, less uh, um, indications, but uh, maybe give you a, a better picture or a closer picture or a more accurate picture on a, on a disease. 
Then we have a clear trend from actually uh, going from a diagnosis simply, a PET diagnosis or SPEC diagnosis, to, into a, a, an area where you have for, um, we have going from therapy, from diagnosis to therapy. And I guess radio pharmaceuticals are a, a prone example that, you know, we can combine uh, diagnostics and therapeutic indications with one of the same targeting molecule by simply switching from, uh, from a diagnostic isotope to a therapeutic isotope. And I'm going to give you a certain few examples from, from our research. This is our current research activity at, uh, at the center, and I'm not going to talk about every, uh, all these aspects. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, uh, the isotope production, so new isotopes which could be of interest. Uh, I'm going to talk about the vitamins used for uh, cancer diagnosis, then two examples about uh, uh, new ligands for the uh, central nervous system, mainly targeting the glutamatergic system, but also the cannabinoid system, and then uh, closing with uh, an example of uh, uh, our most recent uh, research area, which is uh, detection of vulnerable plaques uh, in cardiac disease. Do we have so to actually be, to be able to to perform imaging and all these studies? We need, uh, of course, preclinical pre imaging facilities and devices. So we have currently actually three devices available. Uh, there is a, a Super Argus PET CT from Sedecal. Uh, we have a NanoSpect uh, used uh, located at the Paul Scherer Institute, and uh, we actually have uh, about a year ago we have. Uh, bought uh, this G8 PET CT uh, device from Perkin Elmer. We decided, or you might ask the question why we did we decide on a, buying a new um, a smaller PET CT when we have already a, a large one. Uh, we were actually intrigued by the, the compact size, the low weight of the, of the system, and particularly also about the sensitivity of this, of this new device. And it comes along also with a either integrated X-ray or a CT, uh, which also helps to do morphological images. Uh, I mean, the idea, and actually that was a bit, well, it was a bit a new concept which I proposed when we um, uh, wrote the grant for uh, for getting the funding for this new G8. Uh, the idea is actually that we with this new G4 or G8 system, because it's so small, we can actually make it uh, mobile. Uh, why do we think uh, mobilization of, of, a, of a scanner makes sense? Uh, particularly in Europe, um, uh, particularly in Switzerland, we see the problem that uh, uh, you have, uh, you're facing difficulties in uh, animal studies, uh, you know, transporting anim animals between different locations is uh, getting more and more difficult. And so, um, I mean, and you need, of course, if you then have to split your, your study, uh, two cohorts, one actually doing a therapy study and the other one, animals have to be, you know, sent to the, uh, to the pet uh, facility to uh, do the images. Uh, this is costly and uh, sometimes also prohibitive for, um, you know, if you have uh, special mice which cannot be transported or you have mice which need uh, special attention or a special environment. It's difficult to actually convince uh, research colleagues to also use PET uh, for their research. So the idea is actually that we at the uh, center, we can provide, we have a cyclotrons, we have um, uh, research, we have synthetic, uh, radiosynthetic uh, facilities. And we have a large collection, actually, of uh, available PET tracers from, for preclinical, but also for clinical application. And so the idea is actually that we, we can send the scanner to the to different groups which are interested to do images. And we actually send the scanner along with the radio tracers. And one of the one of the features of this new PET scan is because it's so because it's so highly sensitive, you actually only need a C-type laboratory, which is available in most of the research uh, laboratories, uh, at least here in the Zurich area. Uh, so you can actually install your PET scanner quite easily um, in these uh, in, in these in these laboratories, 
And so the people having or do, conducting the research, uh, you know, will have access to the PET scanner for a period of time. You deliver them, also you provide them with the PET tracer from our research facility, and uh, so they can actually conduct uh, uh, their research and improve their research. And uh, so that was one of the was one of the argument why we considered actually looking into buying uh, such a system. So summarizing again, so advantages for the user community, no transport of the anim animals between facilities, you have access to pet capabilities, which you otherwise would not have if you're not able to actually uh, bring your mice out of your facility. You reduce the number of animals for longitudinal studies. Uh, you have uh, minimal investment uh, for actually having your own, your own scanner. And the last but not least, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, so you know, it also improves potentially your impact for publications. So uh, what I'm going to show you now is a, is a video how we actually you know designed the the concept. Uh, the video will show um, how we designed the cart which is holding the G8 plus computers plus uh, a UPS and an anesthesia facility uh, equipment. And then we will see how this uh, uh, whole device is then transported uh, by a cart for, or a truck um, from one location to another. Uh, it also shows the installation into a C-type laboratory, and um, and well, um, I'm going to start now the video. Hopefully, it, it, it works. I cannot able, I will not be able to to speak over the video. So please enjoy, and then uh, I get back to you afterwards. Okay, it seems like I'm not able Okay, I'm back. So that's uh, basically showing uh, the transportation from the Paul Scherer Institute uh, to the ETH, and you can see that you know uh, it actually quite nicely. You know, you can enter any any uh, common door in the laboratories with this with this device. So I'm going to show you now a few of the uh, data which we have collected with the, with the scanner. Actually, the first uh, examples which you see here is actually taken with the G4, which we installed uh, in 2013, or I guess for, for a couple of months to test. What you see here is a, is a bone scan with fluoride in a, in a mouse, a very typical uptake in, in the bones. And we also have on the, uh, we see here, uh, let me quickly get the arrow here, the You see here the chicken, a chicken embryo uh, system, which we uh, used for uh, also detecting or actually checking um, uh, the device if it's uh, uh, able to image uh, such small um, animals. And what you would I like to point out is the very low um, activity which we have to inject in both animals, uh, and mean it's. After 90 minutes, you really get clearly a, a very nice uptake in in this uh, in this site where uh, fluoride is taken up in, in the bones. Second example was uh, uh, foliprite. We have seen the pictures with foliprite before. Uh, the same uh, distribution. Uh, I also here, just wanted to point out that it is we are able to actually quite nicely. Uh, see the, the small um, regions where the D2 receptors are expressed. 
so resolution is actually quite uh, quite reasonable, and of course we see also the normal distribution of the uh, of the tracer in in the animal. Uh, we see the, also the defluorination of the uh, compound in vivo, which is clearly then indicated by uh, the uptake in the bone. Again, here shows very little activity needs to be administered, and the scan was started 90 per minute post-injection, so uh, it was actually really a very low activity, which is still in the mouse when the, these pictures have been taken. Um, another example is uh, looking at different isotopes. So there is uh, here the uh, mouse scan, which was uh, with, uh, injected with a folic acid derivative here. And we'll go hear more about that uh, in, a, in a minute. So this folic acid derivative has been functionalized with a no-talculating system where suitable for uh, gallium and copper labeling. And you see here the, the animals, uh, the animals, so this is now taken with the G8. So you see here uh, also the CT, which is uh, um, uh, overlaid to the, the PET scans. Uh, just to show that there is actually, you see the, the typical differences in resolution between gallium and, uh, and uh, also copper uh, due to the lower uh, beta plus energy. So clearly also in this uh, G8 uh, scanner, you can nicely see the differences uh, in, uh, in, in the resolution. And uh, of course, copper 64, uh, later time points, uh, uh, or the, the, the better uptake is also seen here in uh, the, the nice uptake can also be seen here in the choreoplexus, even in very small areas in the brains which are made uh, be able to be visible with this uh, with this uh, scanner. When we talk about new isotopes, um, I mean, I see here, the, I show you the map here of, of Switzerland, and uh, in red you see actually the nuclear medical uh, department in Switzerland. You see in green also the, the cyclotron distribution uh, where PET scans, uh, PET traces are, uh, are manufactured and produced. Um, for F18 labeled compound, the logistics are quite reasonable, so the, the red circle basically represents the area where you can distribute uh, on a commercial basis uh, with uh, your, your compounds. But of course, if you uh, go for gallium-68, which is these days very fashion, so people use gallium-68 or promote it very, very heavily, I think it's a very nice isotope. But if we consider that uh, from a logistic point of view or for, you, for, for a, you know, decentralized production, it is really a nightmare. So you can hardly distribute this short-lived isotope uh, to, out, uh, to other facilities, to other hospitals. So there's room of improvement. We're looking actually into other isotopes. So I mentioned copper 64 already. Uh, there is uh, terbium uh, 152, which I'm going to speak in a minute. And there's also scandium 44 uh, with uh, roughly a four hour half-life, which is somehow in between copper and fluor 18. And this, of course, gives you a much broader range of delivery of your compounds, uh, not only for uh, preclinical research, but also, of course, for um, clinical um, development and, and also clinical, um, clinical use. And uh, we also tested those isotopes with the new G8 uh, system because we produce those isotopes and process them usually at Paul Scherer Institute. And the scanner was uh, is basically uh, located at the Paul Scherer Institute. Scandium-44 uh, is an attractive uh, isotope, as I mentioned, and they're actually quite easily produced. Uh, you see here the production route. You can start from, from enriched calcium-44, uh, PN reaction. And uh, the intriguing uh, feature is that uh, you can actually produce that uh, at the low energy uh, cyclotrons or any standard uh, medical uh, cyclotron can produce this, uh, this isotope. Uh, I show you here the, the targetry which we developed here. So it's basically enriched uh, calcium carbonate, which is uh, uh, used. Uh, we have here now 5 to 10 milligrams. Um, enrichment is about 94% of calcium-44. And we actually mount this compound or this, uh, this uh, calcium carbonate on a graphite uh, uh, layer and then uh, seal that in this uh, aluminum uh, capsule uh, you see the, the very thin layer of uh, the calcium 
bicarbonate and we irradiate that for a couple of minutes, half an hour roughly, and we get actually quite a, a decent yield. So we're producing uh, with this amount of uh, material with a irradiation time of roughly uh, 30 minutes up to two gigabecquerels of calcium uh, of uh, scandium 44. We use the Scandium 44 for uh, uh, proof of concept with uh, Dota NOx, so a somatostatin receptor targeting peptide. Uh, again, here this is taken with the G8 uh, system. Uh, we have a low amount of activity uh, again injected into this, uh, this mouse. It's only one. Uh, uh, megabecquerel, three hours post-injection, you see actually a distribution which resembles very much, uh, you see high uptake in the tumors and uh, regular uh, distribution which is very close to, for example, lutetium-177 uh, dotanoc uh, peptide. So scandium is therefore also, <coughs> excuse me, is also um, a good um, surrogate isotope for doing uh, pre-therapy uh, diagnosis and also a dosimetry uh, because it actually resembles, chemistry resembles very much uh, the, uh, the, the, the lanthanides. Speaking about lanthanides, we uh, also looked into a, a, a quite interesting set of isotopes uh, based on uh, the element terbium. Uh, is it actually um, uh, terbium is one of the few uh, elements. We have four different isotopes which are suitable for uh, diagnosis and therapy. So we have on one hand <coughs> the terbium-149 for our, for our half-life, which is an alpha emitter. We have the terbium-152, which uh, at roughly 17.5 hours half-life <coughs> is a beta plus emitter. We have the terbium-155, which is a pure gamma emitter, and we have the terbium-161, which is a uh, beta uh, minus emitter and also has as actually additional OG electrons, quite a substantial amount of OG electrons which are co-emitted. And uh, it's actually quite a nice isotope because it, has, it's very, it resembles very much the lutetium-177. So you can actually, you know, if you do therapy studies, quite well distinguish between the effect of uh, OGs versus pure beta minus uh, uh, therapy. So it is considered, or I, I, I also call, always call it actually the Swiss army knife uh, uh, for radiopharmacy and nuclear medicine because actually you can cover all the aspects of therapy and diagnosis. Today I will just talk briefly about the diagnostic application. So this is again a somatostatin analog which has been uh, labeled with Torbion 152 for PET imaging. Again, this G8 scanner has been used for this purpose. Um, you see here the distribution uh, after 24 hour and here after 32 hours. And um, again, relatively low activity has been injected. Scan duration about 30 minutes. And the longer half-life, or the long half-life actually allows us to have a relatively late time point to see uh, a clearly an improved uh, uh, tumor to kidney ratio. So the tumors are quite uh, re retain the activity, whereas the, the rest of the activity clears quite quickly from, from this mouse. Again, you know, this uh, was be, uh, be enabled by uh, this uh, uh, scanner, which uh, could be mobilized and, and placed at the post Air Institute. A very interesting study, actually, which was recently published uh, with the Terbium uh, 149. Uh, I mentioned this is an alpha emitter. It actually, actually has a very uh, small uh, portion of beta plus emission with about only 7% uh, of the inten uh, intensity. Uh, you can actually uh, no, not even do therapy. We did some therapeutic studies with this alpha emitter quite uh, successfully. Uh, but we also can actually do diagnosis, and you see here we injected roughly seven megabecquerels of this uh, somatostatin analog in the mouse, and you can clearly can see in the uptake or the PET images which show the high uptake uh, in, in the tumors. And so this is, I would say, teragnostics at, at its, its best. So you can do really dosimetry with, uh, with PET images and also do therapy with one of the same isotope, a very rare example, actually.
So we're going to switch now from uh, uh, talking about the, the scan, uh, more about uh, our uh, own research or different research areas which we are currently working on. So neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we, uh, my colleague, uh, the Professor Ahmed Tamai at uh, ETH, he is very much um, engaged into uh, development of traces for the glutamatergic system. So neural death uh, is uh, uh, often observed uh, as, a, as a cascade, uh, starting from membrane depolarization, elevated glutamate levels, overstimulation of the glutamate receptor, calcium overload. And uh, the glutamatergic system is involved in several diseases uh, like schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, Parkinson, Alzheimer's disease, you name it. So it's really a, a very broad indication for such traces. Several years ago, uh, my colleague has uh, developed the carbon-11 derivative, the C11 ABP688. It has been used in several studies uh, in, around the world and also in Zurich uh, we did uh, many studies. One of these is shown on this uh, slide where you do actually studies in sleep deprived uh, uh, volunteers. You can clearly see the uptake of uh, the lower uptake or the reduced uptake of the uh, tracer in uh, or uh, in actually the normal uptake in, in awake per, uh, people and then uh, in sleep, sleep deprived uh, um, patients or um, volunteers you clearly can see an upregulation of the uh, metallotropic glutamate receptors of type 5. Um, this is, was a carbon-11 uh, compound. We wanted to go actually do also out, uh, and deliver the tracer to different centers so we were um, developing or we try to develop a carbon-11 uh, compound. So this is now on the top uh, row you see again the red study using the carbon-11 compound. And you see actually below the floor 18 derivative, we actually tested the several compounds. A, a large series of compounds have been um, developed and tested and this was finally the, the PSS232 which you know shows the features which we would wanted to have for uh, further clinical development. You see um, the same uptake uh, in the area where the glutamatergic system is or the, the receptors are exp uh, expressed uh, here uh, in the area of uh, the, those rats. We developed this into uh, GMP uh, conditions, and you see here now the volunteer study, which has just recently been uh, finalized in Zurich. Uh, on, the right, on the left side, you see the uh, benchmarks so or the carbon-11 ABP compound, which has been published. And on the right side, you see now the study with the FLOR18 compound, uh, compound, which is virtually uh, shows similar distribution, and of course, due also to the to the better decay properties, the resolution uh, is uh, significantly better than in the carbon-11 compound. So with that, uh, we have started already two new uh, uh, new studies in the Zurich area, and of course, we are more than happy also to provide and uh, other centers basically with uh, precursors also even know-how to when they want to would like to use them. Another area which we started to work on is the cannabinoid system. So particularly we're interested in the cannabinoid receptor subtype 2. Uh, it's uh, compared uh, to the CB1, the cannabinoid receptor 2, uh, 1, uh, which is expressed uh, abundantly in the brain. It's actually CB2 is only uh, expressed in the periphery and only under very certain co specific conditions it's upregulated. Uh, so, for example, on the multiple sclerosis, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and of course, uh, we actually we started the, the, the work in collaboration with the AALS uh, Center in uh, in Switzerland. Uh, of course, a prominent uh, uh, patient uh, suffering from ALS is Stephen Hawkins. And uh, so we were really intrigued or we were actually um, motivated to develop such a CB2 uh, receptor ligand for eventually diagnosis uh, of ALS and look for prog disease progression and may eventually also therapy and monitoring. A number of uh, CB2 receptor ligands have been reported. They 
uh, where um, the variable success tested in vivo. Uh, some of them uh, have shown that they actually uh, are PGP substrates, so there's a low brain uptake. Some of them have shown a low uh, metabolic stability. And uh, on the very uh, low uh, left corner, you see the Abbott compound, which is the most promising. Uh, but again, it's a carbon-11 compound, which needs uh, uh, on the, and kind of, you know, having the patient just next to the cyclotron. Uh, this was actually published a couple of years ago was this quinoline derivative, uh, which shows a quite a nice selectivity between uh, CB1 and CB2. So we took this uh, as a lead structure uh, for the development of a carbon-11 and eventually also a carbon uh, fluor 18 compound. So I'm going actually quickly back. Uh, so there's two positions which uh, seem to be interesting and um, able to be functionalized with an uh, isotope. We have uh, here uh, the position for the carbon-11, which we actually also uh, performed and uh, um, developed. And there's also, of course, at this position, you could imagine that you can introduce here fluor-18. That's what we have done. And you see here the development of this fluor-18 compound, this here, uh, R, um, RS126. Uh, uh, which uh, shows the appropriate conditions and um, features for actually uh, in vivo studies. So uh, selectivity is high, affinity is good, and the pharmacokinetic was also uh, proven to be uh, optimal or being favorable. Uh, we did uh, uh, some studies actually in ALS patient spinal cord section. You see that on this slide, uh, where you clearly can see uh, that there is specific uptake of the tracer in the areas uh, uh, of the spinal cord, uh, and this specific uptake can be blocked uh, uh, with uh, a cold compound in excess. So uh, we, are ho we, we hope that this compound or this lead structure is now um, on the way to uh, go into patients and uh, to for, do the first uh, patient studies uh, with a, CB, uh, a suitable CB2 uh, receptor ligand. So switching from CNS now to some uh, examples from cancer. So, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of hype of uh, PSMA-based uh, ligands for uh, prostate cancer diagnosis and therapy. Um, of course, this addresses mainly uh, or exclusive, exclusively, of course, men, uh, cancer which is expressed in men, but there's another 50% population in the world which is also suffering from cancer. And so we are looking into traces which could address uh, uh, cancers which are specifically uh, expressed or overexpressed or um, common in, in female patients. And the folate receptor seems to be in this respect a quite interesting target uh, because uh, the folate receptor is overexpressed in a number of uh, cancer types which is uh, which with high uh, frequency. And there are also therapies uh, available these days, antibodies which are targeting folate receptor for cancer therapy. And therefore, there's a need of uh, developing diagnostic uh, uh, traces for um, uh, selection of patients suitable for the therapy. Again, here is about, um, uh, about 60, uh, 76% of all cancer types do actually overexpress the folate receptor at one of the uh, time uh, of, the, of the development. Folate receptor alpha, the isoform which is overexpressed on the cancer cells, uh, is specifically uh, can be specifically targeted with uh, the oxidized form of folic acid, which is shown uh, on the right top. Uh, it has actually two positions, or it, you can see here from the X-ray structure of the uh, of the receptor, you can clearly see that the carboxylic acid of the glutamate point out of the, uh, the structure, so you can potentially functionalize the uh, molecule at these two positions. This is actually done with a number of compounds, also for chemotherapeutics, and also with radio uh, label uh, with radio labels. And we uh, see that on the next slide, there's actually two approaches. Uh, you can actually introduce the isotope or the, uh, the, the fluor-18 at the gamma carboxylic acid, the alpha or the gamma carboxylic acid or folic acid, and uh, or you can do it alternatively. Uh, and that's what we also try to incorporate the fluor-18, so the so-called integrated approach to actually incorporate the fluor-18 directly into the lead structure. 
This, on the next slide, you see the development of such compounds in our laboratory. You see on the uh, bottom left, you see the first pendant approach, so the attachment of prosthetic fluorine uh, uh, groups at the gamma carboxylic acid. And then on the, the two top uh, structures, you see here now the introduction of the isotope into the lead structure, into folic acid directly here on this uh, benzyl ring or here with this, uh, into this uh, pyridine ring. And I'll show you on the next slide the uh, distribution or the in vivo testing of the compounds. Clearly, the first generation showed uh, in favorable uptake uh, in the abdominal region. You can see the tumors on the left and the right of the shoulders of the, of the mouse. Uh, but clearly there's a high abdominal uptake, which is not favorable. Then we have the first integrated uh, approach uh, compound, uh, which actually shows quite nice uptake, low background activity. There is uptake in the, in the kidney, which is uh, quite uh, uh, normal. Uh, but still the, the, there was the issue about the synthesis. So the synthesis was clearly not optimal for this compound. Uh, low radiochemical yield, and so the, an alternative was now, or the, uh, the alternative was now to develop a, a better uh, compound precursor, which could be more easily in, uh, radio labeled with higher radiochemical yield, and this is, is called the uh, uh, asafolate. You see uh, that there is tumor uptake clearly seen, but also uh, a bit of a higher background activity in the liver. Uh, but this was compound was nevertheless chosen for actually going forward. And this uh, last compound, is, uh, which I've shown you, uh, is now in clinical studies. Uh, a clinical study has started in Zurich and is still ongoing. So now switching to the last topic, we are running out of time. So cardiovascular disease. Um, um, we're going to look at the hallmark of uh, arteriosclerosis. Uh, there are a number of targets which have been identified over the uh, last years. Nevertheless, the holy grail in uh, cardiology is indeed that we have to somehow dis to be able to distinguish between vulnerable and stable plaques. Um, and not all of these uh, targets actually do distinguish uh, vulnerable and stable plaques. So we're looking particularly at new targets. So folic acid receptor beta is one of the targets I highlight in red. And I'm going to talk briefly about CD80 and CD86. So you see here the two potential new targets, CD80 and CD86, a member of the immunoglobulin family, uh, regulatory uh, regulates the T cell activity, and is actually has been identified by us and other uh, groups uh, to be actually also overexpressed in vulnerable plaques. You, we actually get uh, human samples directly from the surgery, so we, uh, we have normal arteries, stable plaques, and vulnerable plaques, which are scored uh, according to this, uh, with, uh, these different uh, features, uh, infiltration of immune cells, size of lipid necrotic core, fibrous cap thickness, and fibrous cap rupture. So that's uh, uh, the level of uh, expression on the mRNA level of CD8 and CD86. You can clearly see a high overexpression of the mRNA level in the vulnerable plaques compared to normal plaques. So this is clearly indicating that there, that could be an interesting target. We have done also mRNA levels on other targets and have never seen such a, a significant overexpression uh, or the difference between vulnerable and stable plaques. Uh, there are only a few small molecules which are suitable for fluoride 18 labeling for this target. Uh, you see here the first uh, compound which uh, is, uh, has been tested in our laboratory. Um, you see here on the next slide also the ex vivo autoradiography, and you can clearly see that the fluoride 18 compound is nicely uh, located, actually it's nicely has a high uptake in the vulnerable plaques, where it actually has a very low uptake in normal arteries or in stable plaques. And uh, you can also displace this uh, uh, uptake of the tracer with, uh, with, with, blocking, uh, with blocking agents. So we hope that with this, um, you know, that actually uh, would be a, a nice target. Uh, we are currently also improving with the pharmacokinetics of this compound. Uh, because uh, mouse studies have shown that it actually clears quite quickly from, from, the, from the blood pool. 
with that, I would like uh, to wrap up and uh, say I think uh, there's more to come in terms of new PET traces and also PET isotopes uh, besides FLOR18 and uh, FDG. And I think it's very important that preclinical imaging facilities and, and capabilities are made available for a broader uh, research community. And I think the, the small and compact G8 system from Perkin Elmer would be uh, an excellent tool for uh, actually uh, making this technology available for more uh, for a broader um, scientific community. Thanks very much. I'm also more than happy to take questions now. Thank you both for your informative presentations. It is time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. DeGrader or Dr. Shibley, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started here. First question for Dr. DeGrado is, what a uh, PET MRI is an emerging technology. Do you see applications that would benefit from PET MRI compared to PET CT? Uh, yes, I would. The, the MRI allows, you know, very good um, anatomic registration of the PET, especially in soft tissues. So if you're, you know, if you have small structures that are being targeted by the labeled cells, uh, you know, it, it would provide a superior anatomic registration for that. Uh, I, I would not expect we would be dual labeling the cells, though, if, if that's what you meant, uh, dual labeling with iron and, and some type of PET probe. I wouldn't do that. But, um, yeah, anatomic registration. Uh, Dr. Shirley, would you uh, speak to this question, too, and let me know if you'd like me to repeat it? Um, so it I mean, is it the same question as uh, was asked before? Yes. Uh, um, just, I just let me know. I, I just agree. Uh, agree what 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 Tim has said. You know. Okay. Great. Uh, how long does it take to get the Moby PET scanner up at each site in terms of minutes, hours? Uh, Doctor Shibley. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, it actually quite quickly uh, gets up. I uh, mean, we can uh, everything is mounted on this on this cart, so um, power supply, everything is set up. Of course, uh, you have to make sure that uh, the calibration is 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 made uh, before you start uh, the PET scans, and uh, it needs a bit of of training to bring this up. Uh, but I would say in half a day you'll be with be set, and you can actually start to do your uh, experiments. How do you know the labeled cells are alive in vivo? In other words, how do you know the labeled cells are functional during tracking? And that is for Dr. Degredo. Uh, that's, that's a really good question. Really, it's only the indirect labeling method that where you get a functional readout because the, the cells must express the report, reporter protein. That's, that's when you know for sure you have a live a cell. Um, and in the direct labeling method, you don't know whether your label has, um, you know, it's, uh, well, you don't know whether the cell uh, remains viable or not. You know the label is, is where you see it in the PET image. Um, so um, it, it, we, we got at it by doing uh, functional measurements that we knew these cells Affected, uh, they, they recovered the, uh, the uh, ejection fraction in our uh, mouse heart model, and uh, we saw that there was uh, no difference between uh, you know labeled cells and non-labeled cells. They both gave the, the same uh, amount of recovery, so that was uh, I guess you would say an indirect uh, proof that the cells uh, function had not been degraded by the labeling. We are almost out of time, so this will have to be our last question. It's for Dr. Shibley. Are there any safety concerns with use of longer-lived radioisotopes in the lab? I presume the longer life helps with aspects such as logistics, uh, for instance, transport. Well, actually, I do not see a big difference between longer-lived isotopes and short-lived isotopes. Of course, I mean, and we're still talking about uh, only a few days' half-lives, and uh, um, so I do not really see uh, big concerns uh, um, about that. Uh, same here. Uh, we 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 don't have any large concerns based on half life. Great, thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Degredo, Dr. Shibley for their presentation. Do you have any final comments? 
Not really. No, from my um, we, we will be answering the other questions offline. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you once again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 15, 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. And also, please note that you can continue to submit questions to Dr. Grado and Dr. Shibley during the on-demand period. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.